Welcome to the College Football Bros, the podcast ranking SEC head coaches. And now, here are your hosts, Michael, Ryan, and Trey Newman. Welcome to the College Football Bros podcast. I am Michael Newman, and I'm joined by my number one ranked brother. That's me, Ryan Newman. Thank you. Whoa. And by the other brother, who's in a tie for first. All right. That's Trey <laughs> Newman. All right. We're off to a good start, guys. No. Uh, I will okay, admit, we have Ryan, final... you jump... Ryan jumped there quick. That was well done. <laughs> he did. That's true. Yeah, it was kind of a race when you think about it. Uh, no, but we have made it to the SEC. This is our last episode of the five Power Five Conferences. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the first four episodes this week, where, of course, we ranked the uh, the head coaches in the other Power Five conferences. As we've been saying throughout the week also, if you like the show, please help us out by spreading the word to your friends, or you can retweet us at CFB Bros when we post the episode, share our Facebook posts, facebook.com slash college football bros. We'd really appreciate anything you can do. Uh, but without further ado, I will stop begging and let's get to the SEC. Ryan, who is number 14 on our list? Sam Pittman, Michael, Arkansas. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. We all had him last. Uh, we were in complete agreement on that. Sorry, Sam. But uh, it's the, only, the, the only other time he's been a head coach was at a community college almost 30 years ago. <laughs> other than that, he's been an offensive line coach, hasn't even been a coordinator. Uh, so it's just like... I mean, he's had technically been crowned like associate head coach, whatever that means, you know. But it's that's essentially a worthless title, in my opinion. So, um, <laughs> wow, it's just a baffling hire. I mean, I, I know they didn't have the pick of the crop there; they couldn't have just gotten anybody they wanted. But well, that's the thing; he was clearly not their first choice as yeah, head coach. Yeah. It, it it's just like it's about as bad of a hire as I mean, which is worse, Sam Pittman or Carl Durrell? I don't know. It's hard to say, but I'll always want to qualify it in that you never know. It could work out. Even the it worst could. hires sometimes work out. So I I know you. But as of this juncture, which one do you think is worse? As of this juncture, uh, I guess I'd say Carl Durrell because at least with Sam Pittman, there's. There's the excitement with recruiting. He's known yeah. as a really good recruiter. So, and he did a good job, you know, in a in a short time closing out the 2020 class. So, yeah, who knows? Maybe he could make a jump in 2021. And this is also more of a play on the fact that it's going to be harder for Arkansas. When I'm just looking purely in the SEC, it's going to be harder for Arkansas to to kind of get back in the mix. I mean, I'm not saying they can't do it. They've they've done it within the last. I mean, with Bielema or not with Bielema, but with the with um motorcycle Petrino? crash guy Petrino. Petrino. there we go mm-hmm. yeah, motorcycle yeah, so it's, crash not, guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that far-fetched that they could get back at least semi-relevant so um but it's going to be an uphill battle with Pittman. oof yeah the sec west right now it's just so t- it's gonna be so tough for arkansas to dig out of this hole it's just not fair uh, I, like if you can go to a bowl game every year like you should be happy if you're at arkansas honestly it's just it's such a hard spot to be Mm-hmm. Right now, it is for sure. All right. Now, moving on to another guy that none of us are surprised he's down this low at number 13 is Derek Mason of Vanderbilt. And I mean, just this year alone, he's lucky to even be on this list and to not have, have been fired. Uh, we've talked about, obviously, how difficult it is to win at Vandy. I mean, Franklin was able to get uh, some some success there. So it's not completely unprecedented. That's pretty darn good. But um, only he's only been to two bowl games. They've lost both of them. They were three and nine last year. Got manhandled in a lot of the games. Um, I do like his charisma, his passion, but it's just not translating to any success whatsoever at Vandy. Yeah, I mean, he's had every year has been a losing season in six years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I will say most coaches, uh, you know, of course, with the notable exception of James Franklin, most coaches do worse, actually, than even Derek Mason has has done. He's, you know, they haven't been they haven't had those one on 11, two and 10 seasons. So there's something to Three be said and nine for that. Is pretty bad. Yeah, but he's he's 13. I think we all agree. Yeah, d- deservedly so. 
Yeah. Okay, moving on to number 12 on our list. We have Will Muschamp of South Carolina. And, you know, his tenure obviously at Florida first did did not go well. He did have one eleven and two seasons, so at least there was one bright spot, but he got he got fired, of course. And at South Carolina, he's 26 and 25 overall there. He has had to deal with some really brutal schedules oh, uh, last insane. year. It, insane. Some insane schedules. Last year had to deal with an injury to Jake Bentley, so he had to thrust a true freshman quarterback that really wasn't ready into the mix. Um, so those are just kind of in his defense, but his seat is still going to be really hot coming into this next season. Next season, Overall, to me, he's a below-average coach, but he's not terrible. Yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate he's got to play Clemson every year now, uh, and they're just top of their game, and then he tosses in some of the other games like Alabama. and uh, I mean, it's it's brutal. And then they're coming up with this 2020 year. They're going to have probably maybe the number one schedule again this year. It's uh, it's a tough gig. I mean, he's, he's made three bowl games in four years, so it's not like he's completely failing there at South Carolina, but I do feel like it's going in the wrong direction. Uh, I'm not yeah, confident and, in Helinski. Uh, I mean, I know he was just a true freshman, but it, it eh, didn't feel like super confident. I mean, it was eh, so. I, I'm with you. I, I, <laughs> well put. <laughs> the worst, yeah. the worst thing going for Muschamp is the fact that in-state Clemson is just you know circling. They're doing laps around him, and yeah. if it wasn't for that, you could maybe make a little bit of a case, but. No, the, yeah, that's hurting it's a just, lot. It's not a good look when someone in state is just able to dominate and take all a lot of the talent. So I'm I'm uh, jumping ahead here, but they've got to get Billy Napier in there. I'm just I really think he could he could turn around. I think he's from South Carolina, and they've got a great fan base. Like it's oh yeah, Williams good. Bryce seems awesome. They should be. Yeah, really, why do they really always good. suck? What's that? Well, Spurrier had him. I mean, pretty good. Besides the Spurrier few years there, they've just been a horrible program. I uh, haven't been weird. Great. It's it is weird. weird. They, I mean, I, we, you know, I like South Carolina. They, the fans are awesome, and the support is there. And it's just, I, I think know. there's, I, I think there's going to be good things in the future because Muschamp's been able to recruit pretty well too. So yeah, he's had some good classes. Yeah, I think the next guy can come in and do. Well, I, I say the next guy like it's inevitable. That will Muschamp gets fired? But it seems we'll like see. It. Yeah, I hope so. I like I, I like cheering for South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's move on to uh, number eleven. Here on our list, we got uh, fresh new new blood, uh, fresh meat, guys, fresh meat. Okay. Eli, that's fresh meat right there. Look at that guy. <laughs> uh, Eli Drinkwitz, um, he's got a good track record, track record of success, but just one year as a head coach. Uh, as past year at Appalachian State, taking over, obviously, a very, very good situation thanks to yeah. Scott Satterfield. So. They had, it's hard to I judge. Mean, there might not be a an easier situation than what he had. They had like yeah, twenty I mean, starters it, back. They had yeah. just gone eleven and two. So yeah. exactly. I mean, it, everybody was back. No, no, there was no way he was going to fail the last year unless he was an absolute awful coach or some unforeseen injuries and stuff. But yeah. So, but if you go back before that, you know, offensive coordinator NC State, he got Ryan Finley to perform very, very well. Going back to Boise, he was, did well. So it's not like he just hasn't had success anywhere besides that one year here at Appalachian State. But it does make you concerned, like, hey, dude, this guy just hasn't been a head coach other than one year and has given a great team. So, you know, he hasn't had to prove that he's a good recruiter. I don't know. We'll see. I, it's You can't put him any higher than what we have, I think, here just because it's, I think we all put him 11th. Um, but I think so. I mean, if you're Missouri, it's worth a shot, I guess. You know, I, I, I'm, I don't blame him. Yeah, in my eyes, he's essentially a first year coach because of what you said. He has handed a, sil- a great team on a silver platter from Satterfield, but now he's in the big leagues. And Mizzou, it's a tough place to win, especially now that they're in the SEC. So he's going to really have to prove it now. Okay. Moving on to number 10. Yeah, number 10. Rocky Top, Jeremy Pruitt. So it's funny because he was he was either going to be fired or last on this list if the Vols didn't bounce back in the second half of the, the season last year. They ended up winning their last six. I, I know it was kind of a relatively easy schedule, but they still did it. But if you told me after losing to Georgia State and BYU that they would rally, like, didn't see that coming. Uh, but they, they did. And, and then they had 
a really good recruiting class, 10th ranked recruiting class this past year. So now he just needs to develop that talent to be able to validate, you know, him moving up in the SEC rankings here. Yeah, I'm definitely encouraged by by the recruiting for sure and the end to the season, like you said, against an easy schedule, but still, they at least they're wins. So that's there's something to be said for that. They they did only finish 35th in Sagarin, so of course we need to see that next step. Um, but with the transfers coming in, the recruiting, I think there's there's some optimism, but not enough to put him any higher than 10. I think this is his absolute ceiling for yep. the time being on this list. Yeah, I'm it's a big third year, I'll say, just to, you know, follow up a decent last year for him. So yeah, I, I agree with everything you guys have said. Okay, and I say it's his ceiling because next on our list is number nine, and we have Mike Leach from Mississippi State. And I'm going to call you guys out here a little bit because let's just let's talk about these next two coaches. Spoiler alert, number eight on our list is Mark Stoops. Both of you put Mark Stoops ahead of Mike Leach, and I strongly disagree with that. So let me make my case here. So Mark Stoops for most of his first five years at Kentucky kind of hovered around 500, which... Well, the first two years didn't make a bowl game ever since then he has. Okay, you can phrase it in a better way. I prefer to use the phrase hovered around 500 because it makes my <laughs> argument better. But either way, the last two years for sure, like those after, but after those first five years, no one really would have thought much of him. Now, the last two years have been very good 18 and eight combined. That's excellent at Kentucky. So Mark Stoops is, is proven he's a good coach, but Mike Leach has done two incredible coaching jobs at two places that are also very hard to win at Texas tech took over a team that had finished the season ranked in the top 25 only twice since 1977. He did it five times in his final six seasons there. That is just insanely good. And then he follows it up at Wazoo. He takes over a team that hadn't been to a bowl game in eight years and he ended his tenure there by going to five straight and he had an 11 and two season in there. So I just don't see why Mark Stoops should be ahead of Mike Leach. Yeah, silence. Well, I, I win. I just no, think, it's a good. They're both right there. I feel like you could have put it either in front of right. They're neck and neck. That's why they're eight and nine here. I don't uh, think they're but, neck and neck, but OK. I feel like Leach. I mean, he obviously didn't finish his tenure all that great at Wazoo. They had kind of they had a decent year this past year, but it wasn't all that great. But Mark Stoops, I mean, Kentucky, that is so hard to win in the SEC. And he's done a four, four straight bowl games at, at, at Kentucky. I don't know. I mean, I, it's, I see your point. I'm totally cool with putting Leach in front of him. But I just don't... I, I, I think Leach at Mississippi State is going to be a little bit different animal yeah. than see, it is in the Pac-12 and Big 12 even. That was my total... I totally agree with that because I, I love Leach. Like I'm as high on Leach as... Uh, than, uh, I'm probably more... Uh, I'm higher on Leach than a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot different at Mississippi State with just the, the depth and the quantity of, of teams in the SEC. I he, I don't know. I He could prove me wrong, and I hope he does because I love rooting for him. I love rooting for his teams. Their offense is fun to watch. But this is a, it's a different beast. And yeah, uh, Stoops-wise, that's fair. Like if we put him ahead, I, maybe if I had to go back, I might put him up a notch. But I'm just, I was looking more in terms of him at Mississippi State alone. Yeah, that's fair because actually I, I make this passion speech for, Mark, for Mike Leach, but I'm actually not that high on him at Mississippi State because, well, because as we'll get to the list, I'm just so high on all these other coaches in, in the SEC West. It's, there's only so many wins to go around. Uh, yep. Okay. Well, number eight, we, we just talked about Mark Stoops. Anything you guys want to add or are we good to move on? No, I think we uh touched I mean, it, it is impressive good. last season to win, what, eight games with a wide receiver at quarterback, <laughs> yeah, yeah. majority of them. So that's kind of what, like, and the year before they had Benny Snell. So it may be they're turning a corner, but obviously before sure. it was kind of eh. Yeah, hopefully they can get an offense, like a legitimate throwing quarterback. That would be nice. Uh, didn't they? They got um, transfer from Auburn. Uh, Gatewood. Gatewood. Joey Gatewood. Maybe he's the guy. I don't know. They could. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, take a brief break here before we get to the second half, half of our list. Trey, why don't you tell us about our sponsor? 
Yeah, we've got myfrontpagestory.com. And so we got Mother's Day coming up. You know, we're in quarantine and you can't really always see your grandparents. So it might be a perfect opportunity to maybe give them a gift. When, and what what the, what myfrontpagestory.com is, is you talk to a professional writer about your mom, your grandparent, maybe your, your wife or husband for an anniversary. Um, you talk to this writer for 10 to 15 minutes and then they end up writing an incredible story about that person. And they make it look, they frame it, they make it look like it was actually on a front page news of a newspaper. Uh, it 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 looks great, can be displayed. It's a great keepsake. It it usually the person receiving it is emotional and and they enjoy receiving the this gift. And bottom line, it's a win win for both of you. You can go to myfrontpagestory.com. If you use the promo code BROS20, you'll get 20% off. So that's myfrontpagestory.com with the promo code BROS20 for 20% off. All right. Awesome. Uh, let's move on to a coach who I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would love to get a gift for <laughs> on any day. Lane Kiffin, number seven, Ole Miss. So... With Lane, the narrative has really been driven by the media uh, so far, in my opinion. He was doing well at SC considering all the circumstances and all the impossible sanctions that he had to deal with. He was recruiting recruiting amazing talent when he was at Tennessee. He did Mm -hmm. great most recently in his stint at Florida Atlantic. And if I was an Ole Miss fan right now, I would be so happy and so stoked because I know that the talent level is going to improve and... They could they could be a, a relevant SEC player here in the next few years. I could not agree more with everything you said, especially when you when you list off all of his stops in college as a head coach. Like you said, the media narrative I think throughout this time is that he's been falling up and that he's been unsuccessful everywhere he's been. I think it's the opposite. I really think he's been successful at each one of those those stops. You know, all things considered, and. FAU, I'll just hone in on that because that's the most recent. They were garbage when he took over, and he went eleven and three in two of his three seasons there. That like that's insane. And he's gonna he's he's one of the best recruiters in college football. So I I think he could he could even be a little bit higher on this list. I know it might sound crazy, but yeah, I mean he went you go back all the way to Tennessee. His, he had one year at Tennessee. He had a winning record there, and it was obviously recruiting very very well. Set up the next person. Could very very well Butch Jones, uh, then USC. He had winning records, and it's just like, why did they get rid of him? I don't even understand why did. They, I mean, if they're, you go back to and you compare it to now, it's like okay, they got rid of, rid of uh, Lane Kiffin after not doing bad. Now they're keeping Clay Helton for so long when he's doing horrible. It's just yeah, we were closer to the Pete Carroll days back then. We yeah, we, it was tough for us to not be competing for national championships after you don't have so many scholarships and whatnot. It just was, he got a raw deal. He got a raw deal. He did get a raw deal because having only 15 scholarships every year instead of 25. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's obviously a huge handicap, but the fact that he was still pulling in like top 10, like he was getting all four or five stars. It was crazy. Yep. Yeah. Can you imagine what he would have done with a full 25 at USC? He'd still be there. He would. Oh, and, and he also did pretty well as Alabama offensive coordinator like Saban tolerated him so he's 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 legit yep yep okay number six on our list Trey's favorite guy Gus Malzahn (laughs) at Auburn I actually might have had him a notch higher as well because when you look at his record I think you basically just have to add a win and take away a loss every year because kind of like West Champ uh, Malzahn always has an insanely tough schedule and just to kind of illustrate that point you look at 2014 auburn was sixth in s p plus even if maybe they were a little bit overrated by that metric the point is they were a very very good team but they went eight and five because they had the number one ranked strength of schedule 2018 they were seventh in sp plus but they finished eight and five because they had the third toughest schedule so i think if you just look at the three four five lost seasons you, you, without context, it makes him look worse than he actually is. But even with those schedules, he's been to a BCS championship. He's been to two New York Six Bulls. He was a game away from the playoff in 2017. 
I think he's a good coach. Yeah, I mean, he's made Auburn relevant almost every season. He's beaten Alabama a few times. They're they're always generally in the SEC West hunt. He's a great offensive mind and continues to churn out NFL talent. Like it's it's hard not to appreciate what Gus has done there yeah, on the SEC, plains. Yeah, SEC West is brutal. I mean, he's always has that tough schedule, and they always have a tough non conference as well. He's won twice as many games as he lost. I, I he's a great coach. There's no other way to put it. I mean, I, the fact that he's even being considered on the hot seat at times is kind of ridiculous in my eyes. Agreed. But let's move on to number five, Eddie O, Ed Orgeron. So, yeah, this one for me, I had him high. I had him at third. Yeah, I strongly disagree with your ranking there. I, I, yeah, I, me too. I'd like I to hear you make your I, case. Well, uh, hello, 15 to no national champ. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. Is that your only case? He's 40 and nine at LSU. That's good. What 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 else does this guy got to do? I mean, he had an unsuccessful stint at Ole Miss. Yes, but that's the thing in the past. Screw that. Forget that. It wasn't the right fit. Maybe whatever. And this uh, USC was an interim coach for a little while, so it was only so the LSU is where I'm looking at, and he's been great. I, I don't get what I, I mean because are you not giving him credit because he hired coaches that were the ones that so it's like Joe Brady was the reason why he was successful. Well, he was the one who hired Joe Brady. He made the choice, like so. I, I'm I'm interested to hear why you have him fifth when he just had maybe the, one of the best teams ever, and he's 49 okay. in his tenure. Okay, I think I could have even had him a bit lower. I I I love Coach O, so I don't want to. He recruits well. He's doing well on the field. What is your problem? all right? Well, Trey, do you want to do you want to refute Ryan or should I, or both? Yeah, well, we we both will. I think we each have points. I'm sure. Okay, well, I'll go first then. So, you know, before this year. All right, let's just go back to one year ago. His seat was lukewarm. Maybe not a hot seat, but you could argue it was a hot seat. And his teams had been in his first few years essentially no better and no worse than the last few less miles teams that ended up getting less miles fired. So that's let's just start from there as your baseline. Now, obviously, 2019 happened. So I, I you have to give him credit for that. That's why he's, you know, pretty high on a list of some really good coaches. So you definitely got to give him some credit for that, but I'm not going to put him ahead of coaches who have had yes. long sustained success at other schools. And you brought up the point about Joe Brady. Yes, I think that is important because like I said, every other year Ed Orgeron's been a coach, it's kind of been like, eh, he's done, you know, eh, you know, losing three or four games at, at LSU. That's, that's how I'd characterize that. And clearly the big difference in 2019 was Joe Brady. He caused that offense to happen. Yes. Ed Orgeron hired him, but can I count on Ed Orgeron hiring a transcendent offensive coordinator every single year? Because he hired a couple guys before. He hired um, Ensminger and uh, Matt Canada, and those didn't work out. So credit to him for cycling through and, and finally getting one that caused this unreal season, which is phenomenal. But I just I just trust other guys who have done it for longer periods of time. Well, that was my the one thing too is that um, they just lost fourteen guys to NFL. I think it was like a record. So he's going to have to. They've recruited insanely, so they've got talent, but he's going to have to kind of prove it again. Uh, the other thing is, I just cannot put them ahead of the guys that I have in the top four just because of their longevity. And we'll get to them, but it would be really hard for me uh, because I didn't look at it just solely on one year. Well, I mean, I don't know. You guys are being a little harsh. I mean, he took over as an interim coach, obviously at LSU. He's done great. He went nine and four the, his first real year. Nothing wrong with that. Six and two in there the There is something SEC. wrong. I mean, it's that's that's mediocre at LSU given the talent you have. That's fine, but okay. Then what's the next year? Losing in the Citrus Bowl. Yeah, I mean, as your first full year, yeah, I'm going to say that's not bad. Ten wins this, the year after that. Ten won the three Fiesta Bowl. At LSU. Won the Fiesta Bowl. Okay. All right. Well, I'll give you that. <laughs> then won the national title. So C C Citrus Bowl loss, Fiesta Bowl win, national championship. All right, you make a good case there. You make a good he, case. He's recruits, I'm not like but I'm off. not saying he sucks. That's not what I'm saying. I just didn't yeah. have him higher than the other guys. Exactly. Exactly. Because as we'll get to this, the, the the four that are ahead of him, holy crap, what a list of coaches that, that yeah. we have. So, so okay. So speaking of that, number four. 
Jimbo Fisher, Texas A&M. Obviously, we all know he got the huge $75 million contract um, and the way, the way oil's going, all those boosters are a little scared that, about that right now. But <laughs> but the Aggies also, speaking of difficult schedules, his first couple of years, the Aggies have had some very tough schedules to deal with. But in the meantime, he's been stockpiling top five recruiting classes. So it's it doesn't seem like it's going to take long. He's proven that he can win at a big program and develop talent like he did at Florida State. He won a national title. I don't see why he can't break through at A&M as early as maybe this season. So I, his Florida State resume still carries weight with me. Oh, for sure. I mean, it was an unbelievable job he did at Florida State, taking over after Bobby Bowden and program had kind of fallen. And he he was winning double-digit games pretty much every year. And he only had one bad year there the last year. So I can I can forgive one year. And uh, yeah, immediately made a and better. Finished 11th in SP Plus his first year, then 21st. And like you said, with the recruits coming in, it's only a matter of time before they have nearly as good a talent as LSU and Alabama. So I think that's going to start to show up with wins. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I, I have him fifth, which is like we've kind of mentioned. It's a very great, great crop of coaches. Uh, the other guys have just proven it at their current schools. So I, I can't put Jimbo there until he's proven it. So it's, I mean, he could very well move up. But right now, he's a top five SEC, and that's a really darn good coach. Moving on to number three, we have Dan Mullen at Florida. And I think we can all agree that that Mullen is a great coach. But Trey, you were the only one to have him in second ahead of, spoiler alert, Kirby Smart. Uh, so Trey, why do you think Mullen deserves to be second? Just just because of what he's done as a head coach uh, at his time at Mississippi State, really good resume. And now two New Year's, he's won two New Year's Six games at Florida. He's pulled in the eighth ranked recruiting class this past year. They're going to be kind of a preseason top 10 team going into 2020. And when you look solely at the coaching, like look what he's done. He turned Felipe Franks into a solid quarterback, at least one that could win. He did the same this past year with Kyle Trask that no one really saw coming. Like I would be so happy and encouraged if I was a Florida fan right now, because I think I think there's a higher ceiling. Well, maybe not a higher ceiling. I'm not trying to compare him to Smart at, with that because Georgia has a high ceiling with the way he's recruited. But yeah. I'm just so encouraged with his pure coaching ability. I can understand the maybe the pure coaching ability factor because Mississippi State, he wasn't getting a ton of talent. He was still churning out good teams. Um, but I just, it's I can't put him over Kirby Smart because recruiting is obviously a huge factor in everything. In two years at Florida, he's done a good job. You said he's won two year two no year six bowl games. Kirby Smart's second year, he made it to the national championship game at Georgia, uh, something that his predecessor wasn't able to do. Number one recruiting class the past couple of years. I mean, I love Dan Mullen. I, I think he's going to do great at Florida. He's going to keep getting them better. And I think Kirby Smart and Dan Mullen are going to be at those respective schools for a long time, and they're going to battle for SEC titles you know, year in, year out. Uh, yeah. But until Dan Mullen does it, like wins the SEC East, Dan, uh, Kirby Smart's done it three years in a row. Until Dan Mullen does it, I, you know, you just got to default go to Kirby in my eyes. Yeah, you probably made an even better case for Kirby Smart than I could, Ryan, because I was going to have a, a tough time arguing against Dan Mullen. He's pretty un, unimpeachable. He's he's done two great coaching jobs so far at, at both schools. So Mississippi State and Florida, of course. But uh all right, moving on to number two, of course, Kirby Smart. We've already talked about him. Does any anybody have anything to add on on Kirby? Uh, if I, the only thing about Kirby, would you guys be discur- obviously he's recruiting insanely well, shouldn't be an issue. But are you guys a little discouraged that the offense took a big step back and they need to improve there? I mean, it's yeah, it definitely is. That's the kind of bugaboo for him. Although they were the offense was good enough to make a really be a play away from winning the national championship but at least I, what is encouraging is that he's made a change he's hired a new offensive coordinator shook up the staff they've brought in a transfer in jamie newman so that's true i think if he was trying to stay keep the same offense or if we see the offense on the field this year and it looks much the same then i'll start to worry a little bit but at least he's shown a 
uh, predile- or he's shown that he wants to change. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. No, and if you have the, I guess if you do have a top three recruiting class, like even if you're stubborn in your ways, you're still going to have a pretty good offense or a pretty <laughs> yeah, good team exactly. overall. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, well, I wonder who could be number one. Yeah, huh. I I really don't even have to say a single word here to explain our rationale on why Nick Saban is number one. I mean, what would it take for Saban to be dethroned here? Like, he would have to kick a puppy or like, oh, well, I mean, yeah, I, as far I as SEC coaches, I mean, Kirby's that might not even turn it up. Saban, man, it's uh, he's got it on lockdown, of course, with six national nationally, championships nationally putting Dabo in front of it's it's Dabo and Nick Saban is one two nationally who is can you put Dabo in front of Nick I I not yet I still got to go with Nick Saban just because of the longevity seeing it at multiple schools um but they're neck and neck yeah yeah I'm with you yeah okay let's uh let's pull up the list then uh sorry Nick you don't get a lot of you're just you're too good so we can't talk about you for very long uh Okay, here we go. For those viewers on YouTube, we're now looking at the all 14, our, our 14 uh, rankings here. So any general thoughts about the SEC before we close out uh, rankings week? Like we already we mentioned in the previous episodes, I mean, it's just, it's the best group of coaches in the in the country. There's just... Yeah, and if you look at the top six for sure, I mean, we can start to include Kip Fan and others, but the top six for sure is like... That's that's murderer's row of coaches right yes. there. But even when you go down seven, eight, nine, I mean, Kiffin has been great, uh, you know, FAU, and he's doing a really yeah. well. Stoops has done a remarkable job at Kentucky. Leach has done two unreal jobs at two really hard places. I, I feel like Leach being ninth really makes it hit home. Holy moly, how good these, yeah, these exactly. coaches are. Yep. So, I mean, it's... It's tough, man. It's a tough conference. There's no, re- there's. It's not surprising that they've had the set a record this past year in the draft for first round draft picks. No. So where would where would Leach be if he was still in the Pac-12? He's ninth, of course, here in the SEC. Ooh, Pac-12. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I mean, he would have an argument for top. Three. I mean, I guess he'd have an argument for number one. I wouldn't put him there, but he'd probably no. be like third. I guess I don't know. Yeah, he he's in the upper third. Whittingham, like, Crystal Ball, and then Leach. It's then Leach, yeah. I maybe. mean. Right, he's some right people there. would still was... put David Shaw, but I'm not sure I would. No, I, I yeah, have Leach in front of Shaw. Yeah, yeah, we know that. But he, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, I it's that's a great way to put it when you look at where would Leach be in another conference. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll do it for college football head coaching rankings week. We hope everyone enjoyed listening. If you like the podcast and would like to get bonus episodes and access to our Discord chat, or if you just want to support what we're doing, we'd, we'd really appreciate that. You can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash college football bros. So thanks, everyone, especially if you watched all five of these rankings episode. Really appreciate it. And we will talk to you next week. You've been listening to the College Football Bros. If you have any questions for the next podcast, email them to collegefootballbros at gmail.com. To keep up with the brothers on social media, like them on Facebook at College Football Bros, follow them on Instagram at College Football Bros, and for their commentary on Saturdays, follow them on Twitter at CFB Bros. Thanks for listening.